Okay. I have to run over there and do the presentation. Yeah, Those guys. Pro. If, yeah, anybody that sends me the PowerPoints, I'll yeah. make sure to include them. I'll PDF them okay. so that yeah, they don't pilfer. Would you please send him the PowerPoint? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put it in the I don't think I recorded Sorry? my stuff. This is all right. Yeah. 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 Oh, no, no, no. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, what is that? <laughs> 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 yeah. I was wondering, do we do clinics? Do we talk about nutrition? Do we get the kids at lunch? It's a yeah. <laughs> All right, see you, Mike. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hey guys, I uh, apologize for showing up late. Um, answering questions on the other other uh, the Colorado Wrestling Coaches Association. They're also here too. So uh, my name is Brandon Cycle. I'm one of the strength coaches here um, at the center. Um, I work in conjunction with Paul Titus. He's another strength coach. Um, he just had a lot of athletes um, today, um, so I'm kind of filling in uh, for him. But he is the head acrobat and combat strength coach but we do work very close together. Um, I still work with the wrestlers, all that stuff like that. So share a couple things from you from a strength and conditioning side of things. Also, I wanna let you know that I am in a, I'm taking a certification course right now for anthropometry, like skin folds and stuff. My test is at 310, my, my final practical. So I'm like all over the place right now. So I'm gonna try to get through this in a practical manner. Just wanna give you guys a heads up. And around 3, let's say 303, 304, I gotta jet out of here and run to my practical. Is that okay? Yes. All right, thanks. Appreciate it. Yeah. Absolutely not. Yeah. 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 <laughs> we are gonna lock the doors. <laughs> All right. So, starting off, I, I want to go over uh, the concept of movement with you guys. Um, Movement, we, we know how important movement is for athletes. You gotta move well, wrestling, you're moving in different directions all the time. You're on the ground, you're standing up, uh, you're rotating, you're, you're moving laterally, forward, backward. You're doing all these different movements. Um, so we have, from a strength training perspective, um, and you guys probably, I'm guessing, are, are in conjunction, you guys are the strength coach as well, or do you guys have your own strength coach? doing both wrestling and strength and conditioning. Okay, so a couple things in, in terms of movement. You see we have different joints of the body up here. Joints, the ankle joint, knee joint, hip, lumbar spine, which is low back, um, thoracic spine, which is more of your upper back, scap, scapular region, which you have this big muscle back here called, or your bone back here called your scapula, um, and then obviously the shoulder. So when I talk about mobility, talking about um, making sure that the, the joint can move freely. It has, it has adequate range of motion, up and down, sideways, rotationally, good range of motion. When I say stable, that joint, you want that joint to be, you don't want that joint to be moving all around. So the knee joint, you don't want that joint to be moving all around. That's not a good thing. Um, you want it to be stable. So joint by joint approach, uh, it's very straightforward. You want the ankle to be mobile, knee stable. Hit mobile, keep going down the line, it's just piggybacking. Mobile, stable, mobile, stable. Now what oftentimes happens in terms of movement with people, you get an athlete, you tell them to perform an overhead squat and they have a dowel back here. They squat down, they start going like this where they're rounding, their knees come over their toes, maybe they can only squat this far down with good technique. So that, that tells us a couple things. It tells us, all right, maybe they do have a mobility issue that we need to address as coaches. So, if it's a hip mobility issue, maybe it is because they can't get their hips down. But it also could be an ankle mobility issue, especially with a squat. So if you're, if you're assessing somebody, or if you're looking at somebody's squat, and I'm talking body weight, not loaded, and they can't get down, nice, Low, back flat, knees over the toes, chest up, um, heels on the ground. You can do one of two things. You can, if they're like this, you can raise their heels off the ground, and if they get deeper by doing that, automatically think it's an ankle mobility. 
They do not have sufficient range of motion in their ankles, which is compromising them to squat lower. Now, if they still have the same movement pattern after raising their heels up, then you can say, all right, maybe it's more of a hip mobility issue. Maybe it's a thoracic spine issue. But I'm kind of getting off target here. The main point of this is saying, if one of these joints that's supposed to be mobile is not mobile, it's restricted in movement, the joint above or below that that's supposed to be stable is, be going, to, is going to become compromised. It's going to be doing more work than it needs to do. That's when injuries start occurring. That's when you're getting your ACLs, when you're getting MCLs. That's when you're getting walking around with low back pain all the time. And, and a lot of times, you say, oh, you have low back pain? Oh, you need to do back extensions. You need to do supermans. That's not, that's not the cause or the root cause of why they have back pain. Oh, your knee's hurting? Oh, we, we, should, do, we should do more squats. That's not the reason why, why they're having knee pain. The reason why is because their hip uh, the range of motion of their hips is not adequate. The range of motion of their ankles is not adequate. The range of motion of the thoracic spine is not adequate, which is decreasing stability of the other regions. They're working harder than they need to do. Need to. So making sure that we are spending time, especially on the hip, especially on the ankle, trying to free people up, the hamstrings, making sure that we are flexible and mobile those regions um, doing doing different types of exercises and warm-up drills like dynamic flexibility doing those types of drills on a consistent basis to help warm them up and help them to become more mobile is going to help these areas to actually do their job and not overwork any questions on that you're just using uh, certain joints you're just targeting certain joints yeah those are the, those are the main joints in the body yeah. You know, I mean, so the knee is so stable. So you're, what you, what you, what's the difference between mobile and stable? So mobile, you, it's a, uh, an increased range of motion in that joint. So my head joint, I don't want, I want to be able to squat well, right? I want there to be movement in my hips, correct? But would you want there, do you want your knee to be moving all around all the time? You don't want that, you want it to be stable. And that joint is meant to be stable. But what I'm saying is with these other joints that are supposed to be mobile, you get an athlete or an individual, probably a lot of us, come <laughs> walking around, we're like, ooh, gosh, I'm stiff. And we're not mobile here and we can't move well. That's actually going to, our knee joint, and the musculature, ligaments, and tendons around that joint are going to compromise and do more work. What about the thoracic spine? What do you mean by that? Thoracic spine? So your thoracic spine is, uh, up here, so it's actually you have different vertebrae that make up that part of your spine. And drills that we do, a simple drill, um, you could keeping your hips square, a thoracic spine mobility drill, which is opening up right here. And that's helping to create movement in that region of your spine. So it can move more freely. If it's restricted, like I said, if this is restricted in mobility and movement, then your lumbar spine is going to be doing more work. Your scap is going to be doing more work. And if your scap does more work, those muscles that attach to that bone doing more work, that's when you start getting rotator cuff problems. So it's more it's short. It's more rotational. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thoracic spine is, is more thoracic rotational movements. Correct. So again with uh, moving on to the movement. Uh, what we teach our athletes when they come in is fundamental movement patterns without any weight. We actually have a, a phase of training where they do not do anything with a, with a bar, they don't do anything with any external loads, they do everything with body weight. So we know that they can perform movements that we want them to perform that are basic movements that are going to, that we will load, that's going to help them become more uh, stronger and more powerful, such as squat. So we'll have our athletes in, we'll start with a, a dowel. We'll do an overhead squat or a normal squat. Um, we'll teach them how to perform a correct lunge, and I'll get to this in the next slide, um, what you're looking for. How to hip hinge correctly, and how to do upper body pushes correctly, upper body pulls correctly. Um, also, from a ground up approach standpoint, um, teaching them uh, like mobility patterns, I'll quickly show you guys just an example.
ground up. When we're talking mobility, this is a this is a hip mobility drill that we do every day with our athletes. On the ground, we call this active straight leg raise or hamstrings. Keep both legs straight, other one on the ground, so we'll do that. Then we'll go into knee tucks. Then we'll go into ankle grabs. This is all from the ground. Then we'll go into circles. This is all creating range of motion in the hip, getting this thing loosened up. So that's one thing that we can do. And then we, so it says ground up. So stomach and back. We can do different things from here. We can do uh, shoulder and scapulization stabilization exercise. So different things like this. Different things like this. So just warming up that part of the body. Getting mobility, creating, helping to create stability. From there, we can go to a like I said, the push-up position, push-up position, teach them how to properly execute a push-up position. We can do different things from here. We can work on hip mobility. We can do a calf stretch. We can do an ab stretch. We can twist side to side and get our hip flexors. So we're just going from the ground up, and we a quadruped just means on all fours. So now I'm on all fours. I'm doing fire hydrants, I'm doing reaches. We're out to the side. We can do thoracic spine rotations. We can do leg lifts, glutes. From there, we go to high kneeling. This could be a high kneeling position where you're on both knees. And it's beyond my butt, beyond my head if I want to get thoracic spine rotation. Keeping my hips square, just rotating at my upper back. From here, I can go to half kneeling. Right here, where I can get more hip flexor stretches this or rotating um, different things like that and then we can go to athletic stance single leg and then once we're into athletic stance that's when we can do our high knees karaoke is more of our dynamic movement patterns we're actually moving um, that's just what I mean by a ground up approach it's just an example um, so main point, do not load the movement if the athlete can't execute it with body weight. What I mean by that, here are proper executions of the movement patterns I just displayed to you guys. Proper squat, feet are flat on the ground, shifting his weight towards his heels. Knees, if I drew a line from his knees to his toes, it would be a straight line. His knees aren't severely over his toes. If we're doing that, we get a lot more quad. We don't want quad, we're already quad dominant. We gotta get this backside strengthened a little bit better. And a lot better in my opinion. Back is flat, chest is up. You can see that he's hanging onto a band. This is assisting him in the movement. So teaching an athlete how to do this, we either use bands, we use boxes, where we put a box behind them, arms out, that gives them more leverage to learn. So arms out, light touch. Look down at your toes, can you see your toes? Yes, that means your toes aren't over, good. Come up, keep your knees out. That's another thing with the squat that we see a lot of times. People coming down, they squat down, their knees come in. Or their knees are out, and then when they come up out of the hole, their knees start to collapse inward. That puts a lot of stress onto the ligaments and tendons on that joint. Over time, over years of doing that same thing, no wonder why they had an ACL. People say, oh, why they have an ACL? It's not because of that moment. It's because years and years of doing incorrect patterns incorrect movements, that wear and tear over time is going to take its toll. A lunge, see so it has a 90 degree angle, 90-90 with the top leg and front leg. Um, foot flat on the ground, again, knee is straight up and down, his knee is not over his, over his toes. That means that we're getting a little more backside work as opposed to all quad. Um, his knee is always an inch from the ground. You see a lot of people banging the knees on and off the ground. A couple things with that. Over time, that's going to lead to damage of the knee joint, of that capsule. And maybe it won't show up the first weeks, months. Over time, if you keep banging the knee on the ground, it's going to cause damage. Number two, if we're talking about maximal strength development, and we want to create as much tension in the muscles as possible, you think banging the knee off the ground and getting a little, little bit of momentum is going to help do that. 
It actually causes the muscles to rest for just a split second. We want there to be maximal tension. How hard can you make the muscles work? So by not touching the knee to the ground, you're accomplishing that. Now, back to slide. Yeah. Question, do you have, I mean, I guess, it's, it's easier said than done, don't let your knee touch the ground and that inch, but do you use any like foam padding or anything? Like, once you hit that, like if you hit it, you've gone too far. Totally. In totally. that sense. Totally. We'll put that down for athletes, put a foam pad, and uh, sometimes if I, if I have a group of athletes and I'll, I'll be standing right here and I can see, if I see their knee, just put a divot in that pad, that rep doesn't count. Do it again. Light touch. Very light touch. Or, or, or uh, uh, but yeah, just to get that sensory awareness, what did you feel like? Yes, we do utilize it. Um, a hip hinge, it's, it, it's amazing how many athletes, how many people do not know how to simply do a hip hinge. Because again, we oftentimes use this part of our body so much, when I tell an athlete to demonstrate how to do this, their first movement is knees forward. And then they try to do like a squat deadlifting motion. And that's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to activate the musculature of the hamstrings and glutes by pressing the hips back, and the angle of the knee doesn't change. It stays the same. So getting that down, because number one, if you, wanna, if you want your people to know how to jump correctly, if you want them to know how to perform a, a clean pull into a hang clean, if you wanna teach those patterns, they don't know how to do this, and those, pattern, and those other exercises are gonna be jacked up. They will not perform those correctly. So this is all, all of this feeds into what we want to do in the future. What you guys want to do in the future in terms of developing strength and power. So that's a hip hinge. Uh, great story, I'll, I'll keep this short, but one of our Greco world team wrestlers, he's, uh, he's new to our, our residency here, great kid, but we, we put him through these tests and he overhead squat with the dowel, it, it looked like this. That's, that was it. I was like, you're, you're a world class, you're a world class wrestler. That's, that's, that's ridiculous. <laughs> this, is, this is insane. So the past three weeks, once they got back from Worlds, it uh, hasn't been going on. This is the third week. All, all we've been doing with him, I was like, all right, you have five sets of 15 reps of this 60 second break in between. After you get done with that, you're going to hold on here. You're going to do 30 seconds of this, pressing your hips back, feeling it back here. In between that, you're going to do T-spine rotation. Because he had horrible thoracic, he could not move up here. He couldn't rotate well. It was all his low back. You're doing this. He can only go right here, but over the weeks, he's got better. And then for squatting, all right, all you're doing is Having a dowel, and you're just squatting to here. That's it. That's your workout, man. That's all you're doing. <laughs> and uh, you know what? <clears throat> now, you do the same thing. Now, now over three weeks, he has a pulley system behind him. He has a cable. He's actually doing a cable pull through now. Now, he's holding this with no hands. Now, He's squatting onto a chair. But you know what it was? It wasn't because he wasn't strong. It wasn't because, even it wasn't because he was not necessarily mobile. Um, it was because his brain was so used to doing something one way. We had to restructure his brain on how to move well. And now his brain finally knows how to do the correct movement. So he's getting. Or he had a very weak core. So maybe it looks like sometimes you think it's a mobility issue? Oh, he has horrible hip mobility because he can only get here. But then you tell him, you take a 10 pound weight and have him hold him out in front. That activates your abdominals, makes you tense up, and you can get low. And it's like, oh, it's not a mobility issue, it's just he's not he have any stability in his core. You have to work on his core stability so that he can actually perform that movement and have enough stability here to support that. Once we did that, I mean, he's flourishing. I, I, I think he's got two, two more weeks to actually start loading him up with a bar. We won't even go to the bar. 
We'll go to Dundal right here first. Um, yeah, it's just an elite athlete story that we do. And then uh, push-ups. Push-up position. It's crazy, uh, teaching the push-up, making sure that the hands are right, right underneath the shoulder, the butt is tight. Because essentially, a push-up is just doing a plank. And you're in a push-up position. A plank, same position, you want to squeeze your butt. And if I put my hand right here, this is what I tell our athletes, put your hand right here and then press your lower back into your hands. Really press. That's going to tighten your abdominals. It's going to make that very stable. So that's the, the position that you want to hold while you're planking and when you're doing push-ups. A very squeeze your butt, tight abs. Press that. If not, I mean, you're not getting as much out of the movement as possible. Pull up. Um, we as, as wrestlers, wrestling coaches, we love pull ups. We utilize them a lot. But a couple things. You see, uh, this athlete right here starts all the way down. He finishes all the way up, chin above the bar. Another point with the, the pull up is we see a lot of athletes rounding their shoulders. If you can right now, just go like this, pretend you're pulling up around your shoulders. Where do you feel that the most? You feel it right here and right in the bicep. The whole point of a pull up is your lats, your backside, your upper back. So you're not accomplishing the goal if that's, that's what you're doing. So we, we advocate our athletes and teach our athletes where they're pulling back, you're leading with your chest, pulling your shoulder blades back, keeping the shoulders back. Now I feel in the upper back. That's where I want to feel it. Getting full range of motion. A lot of times you see athletes do these half reps. Well, we're not getting full range of motion. Yeah, yeah it's great that you're getting strength from here to here. But you, you are not getting strength from here to here. In that muscle, in that, range, in that, in that movement. So full range of motion. And what we do with uh, many of our athletes is we start off with a band. Put a band attaches to the pull up bar underneath their feet and assist them on the way up. If you don't have a band, use your partner. Go under the foot and notice that I did a good spot right there too. <laughs> not bending over. Up, assist them, and then he can lower or she can lower it on the way down. Assist up, you can lower more weight than you can raise so they can lower their body weight on the way down. That's teaching them the correct mechanics. Are you doing, <coughs> I'm sorry, are you doing chin-ups or pull-ups? He's doing pull-ups right there, but same, same. if you're doing a, a pull-up, if you're doing chin-up, same concept. Neutral grip, same you know, concept. One is better or worse for you? Um, this is going to get more, so a little more stress on the shoulder, going like this. This causes the least stress on the shoulder, and what, if you have the, the bars to be able to do a neutral grip, I would advocate that. Chin-up, you're going to get a little more bicep in that. Um, pull up, I know there's some research that shows that you do get a little more lat activation from the pull up as opposed to the channel. But in terms of shoulder, um, I normally start off with novice individuals, neutral. So, what would you recommend you try to hit all areas like, you know, neutral, how many, you know, pull up, chin ups, how many, in like, kind of combination to hit all yeah. those critical points? I mean, what you could do, I mean, you're still going to hit those critical points, regardless of what like you do. Like how many reps per how many sets? Like what, what do you feel is kind of critical each set or each individual, you know, motion should you be doing? Like, Yeah, that's that's a good a good question. And I actually have a slide on that in terms of when we talk a little about a bit about periodization and like how to go about doing that and the intensity that you want. Because you could do 10 reps or 12 reps we're in more of an aerobic, a foundational phase, building a base. Ten reps where you're not going to max. You're just you're getting a good tempo, 10 to 12 reps, or whatever that, that rep target is if you need assistance, but not max. Then if you go to a higher intensity phase of training, where, or, or it's, a, it's a training day where we are going to failure, maybe, um, that's, that's the athlete. It's not necessarily the number of reps all the time, it's the intensity that you do it. Um, so I will get into that when we talk about the periodization process. Um, that's, that's a good question. Good question. So the total number that we're talking about. Yeah, because if you're doing like 10 pull-ups, 
10 chin-ups yep. and then I guess like 10 neutrals. Like what your set versus your number in the sense of like starting in Oh, I, if, that, if that was that, I would go, if you're going to do it that way, I would go three sets. So that's three sets of upper back. Those would be my three sets. Even, like I don't have to go a million of each. So you, like, you're, I go one, one, and one. One set, one set, one set. And just 10, 10, 10? Yeah, 10, like, and, 12, and it'll, 12, depend, 12. It'll, it'll depend on the phase that you're doing. Okay. But I'll give you some guidelines. All right. Inverted row, same concepts as the pull-up, except now you're, you're horizontal, you're rowing instead of pulling up vertical. Um, but same thing, shoulders back, retract the shoulder blades. Right here, not right here. So warm-up, uh, I know you guys all warm up. Um, Probably you guys do dynamic warm-ups uh, with your athletes before, um, and that's the way to go. Uh, the, the old adage of stretching before before training that actually has been shown to decrease force output and power output. Um, so we want to do dynamic movements. So a couple of things with the warm-up: it restores function to the joints. So we talked about movements. You want those joints to function well. That's all about the, the little mobility thing that I did beforehand. That, that, could, that was a part of a warm-up that we do. It's like the first phase of the warm-up. So sometimes you have muscles that are inhibited or aren't activated, aren't turned on, and you need those muscles to be in order for your training to, to be a, at a high performance level. And sometimes you have muscles that are over-activated or areas of your body that are turned on way too much or they aren't stretched enough or they're overstretched that you have to switch off in order for the muscles that need to turn on, to turn on. Um, a great example of that is your hip flexors. We all sit all day pretty much. And you're, you're, you're athletes, they're sitting in class all day. So what happens to the hip flexors, it shortens. What's, what's the opposite muscle of the hip flexor? Hamstring. Hamstring, but a little above it. Gluteus. Gluteus. Glute. So that's the antagonistic muscle. So this is shortened, this muscle is going to be turned off, or it isn't going to optimize, it's not going to contract as forcefully as possible. I'm talking about, we're talking about power, lower body power, where does much of that force and power come from? Your butt. So if that's not working well, you go to try to try do a forceful movement in wrestling, or if you're going to squat, you're going to go do a jump. It's not going to be at a high, the highest performance level that you can. That decreases our training. Maybe you don't know that as a coach, but <coughs> you just spent training at a 70% effort as opposed to a 95% effort or higher, where it needs to be. Hey, Everett, how was Slay's ass? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so making sure that when we're doing that, like with all of our athletes, I'm making sure that we're spending time stretching out the hip flexor. If I stretch that out, that's going to help optimize glute activation. After I get my hip flexors and hips warmed up, kind of like that series I did and doing, uh, <laughs> doing that, I can optimize glute activation and kind of wake those suckers up by doing simple glute bridges or single leg glute bridges or fire hydrants, <coughs> stuff that's utilized in the glutes that's kind of waking them up, getting, getting them primed, ready to go. So, um, so that's restoring function to joints. Increasing neural drive, that's just a fancy way of saying what I've kind of been saying is getting the Ferrari ready to go, not putting diesel into the, into the engine, putting some high premium gas into that engine. So, <coughs> so with that, you saw the little warm up that I did here and I'm saying in terms of a warm up, go from a low to moderate to a higher approach. So that was very low intensity stuff that you saw me do right there. After I did that stuff, what I would do is, with an athlete, I'd go to more moderate intensity. That's where I'd go do my karaoke's, my high knees, my butt kicks. After that, okay, I'm starting to wake the system up more, more and more. Now I need the system to be ready to go. I need my fast twitch fibers to be ready to go. So when I go, at least with my athletes, I'm not advocating this for your athletes if you don't have proper coaching for But okay, we're going to clean. We are going to clean, and we are going to clean at a very high level. And if these fast twitch fibers aren't ready to go, <coughs> their force output in terms of coming down here, lifting up, and getting under the bar is 
it's not going to be as hot. So right here, the higher approach, that's where we're doing maybe high frequency, high knees. This is an example where I'm standing, from you to me, standing here, I'm saying, you're going up as high and fast as possible, you're getting to me in 10 seconds. So a lot of the athletes, they start, they're, they're going fast that way. I'm like, I don't want you fast that way. I want you fast up and down. Fast, fast, wake that system up, go. Um, maybe we'll do different line drills where they're going like this. Just little, just simple like high school football, football drills. But it's waking the system up because you're going at a very high intensity. Would it include gymnastics kind of movements too, tumbling kind of things? So that's where the, uh, the lower intensity, where we do those in the lower intensity. We do our rolls, we do our tumbles, we do, we do stuff like this. I'll give you an example. It's a very good point because it's amazing how we grow up when we're babies, we know how to how to tumble, we know how to roll. As we get older, we forget all that stuff. So reteaching, especially with combat athletes, how to simply do going from here to here. Going from here, doing that, into here, doing that type of stuff. Going from a, a tuck here, now, learning how to move, learning how to roll. We're reteaching our athletes that. And uh, because we forget it over time, but we put that here, lower intensity. So that isn't causing a lot of activation. Are you in a lot of, uh, like I know, I don't know about you guys, but you know, the kids run and they warm up, ideally, right? When are you plugging running in, or are you not plugging running in? Is that a kind of an aerobic type of... For conditioning? Uh, for not conditioning, but for warming up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll definitely do that before. Okay, right. yeah, that's more of the slow. Okay. Low, we'll kind of get the heart rate up a little bit. Go to our on-the-ground stuff, our, our dynamic flexibility. Moderate, or a kick up the intensity in terms of dynamic movements. High knees, karaoke's, over-the-hurdle skipping, a skips. And then after that, we'll get into our higher intensity. Um, uh, the stuff that I kind of demonstrated where you're, you're activating. I think it's taking the gymnastics movement so a little bit differently, a little bit higher level, like your hands spring, three quarters, yeah. that kind of stuff. Would that be more, would that, would that fit in there? Yeah, you can, you can fit that stuff in if it, they, they have the shoulder stability and all that stuff to do those properly. Yeah, now that could be in more of the moderate aspect. I would, I would, I put it in phases, you know, like low, moderate, how I feed my warm up with athletes. I put that more in the moderate. Yeah. Next is a warm down. Some people call it a cool down. This is very important after practices or after in between, in between matches. A couple reasons. It decreases neural drive and muscle tension. So you guys know, you guys have all competed. Um, after, after a training session or after a, after a uh, competition, whether it was very challenging and you're you're dead or not, your system's still alive. You're woke up. You're like, whoa, I'm ready to go. What that causes over time, if you don't deal with that and do some relaxation things after your, your uh, training session, causes muscle tension. Any of you foam roll? So you foam roll and you, people say, oh, I'll have a knot right here, a knot right here. They call them trigger points. You're trying to get that trigger point out. It's not necessarily because uh, it's just yeah, the muscle's tight, but the reason why is because neurally, your nervous system is overactivated. And the motor units or muscle fibers in that area of the muscle is overactivated. They're turned on at such a high level that they're, it's creating all this tension. You have to release that. Um, so by warming down, that allows your nervous system to calm down. You're not in this high level state. That's like going and practicing, having a late night practice and then having your kids try to go home and sleep. Not going to bed. They're, they're probably going to get a bad night's sleep because their nervous system is so revved up. Yeah. Uh, so talking about the foam roll, is that better to do before or after? Both. Both. So we foam roll before our warm up if we have access to foam rolls. If you don't have access to foam rolls, you can take tennis balls, you can take shot put balls. Um, balls. Yeah, whatever. You can make go to Home Depot, get PVC pipe. Um, you could just do PVC pipe, thick one, or you can put some some uh, 
something around that, like rubber or something around that. Yeah, I, I think it's it's very good. I, I think it's a very good thing in terms of helping breaking up some of that connective tissue that can get really bound up and, and decreases movement efficiency. To use the ones with the knobs on them? Yeah, yeah, we use both. I mean, yeah, we'll Do use both. one over the other? I like the one with the knobs, so I think that kind of gets in there a little bit better. That's just personal preference. Okay. Where do you stand on the sprints after a match? Like, uh, I know what, what we did in college and also some sure here. Yeah, yeah. Sprints after a match, you know, for like expanding along the past, you have that on your down. Yeah, so sprints after a match, and this is what I was going to get into the next part of the cool down, was increased removal of waste products. But there's if you're going all out sprinting after a match, I wouldn't necessarily advocate that. And we actually did a study here this past year on our women's freestyle and men's freestyle teams and they were doing a camp. And we took their blood lactate, we pricked their fingers, got their blood, looked at how much lactate was in their blood. Um, and then we had different protocols of warm downs. And what we found was that warming down at a perceived effort like 60 to 70 percent, so it's not all sprint, it's not a little jog, somewhere in between for around three to five minutes and then decreasing that level of intensity for an additional three to five minutes, so a total of anywhere seven to ten minutes of total cooldown time, that helps remove lactate in a practical manner. You could go longer, but who has 15 minutes after a match to do that? Our athletes aren't going to do that for 15 minutes, I'll tell you that much. They'll, they'll do it for seven minute stops. So, all out spraying, that's going to just lead to more lactate production. It's not going to help with the clearance rate. But you can't go at such a low intensity right here where you're not getting optimal contraction of the muscle. So, you have to have muscle contraction, optimal contraction, in order for the muscle to contract, which is going to remove the bad waste products out of the muscle into the blood so it can be carried. In. What if the match that you have is a very short duration match? Okay, so so you've got as long as you can go in yep. the match, the short you can go in the match. Where is this been? Yeah, so I would, uh, if it was like yeah. really easy, quick, not too much. Your spirit you really don't have to do much. Um, and maybe a light cool down if, you, if there's any buildup of fatigue. But if it, it was like 15 seconds, 20 seconds or something, yeah, is he going to start producing some fatigue? And uh, lactate, especially if it's that 15 seconds of maximal effort, 20 seconds maximal effort, yeah, he's going to get lactate production, definitely. But uh, the amount of cool down after that, I'm going to have to be as extensive in my opinion. Uh, we were, uh, a lot of times our guys will have them do a match before they just get to get their heart rates up. Yeah. For a cool down. yeah. But if you do that, you sit to them, sit for a you know, like, you might have your heavyweight not wrestling for an hour. That's the thing. So that's, that's, that's the time. What do you do there? Do you, so, do you like, you love jogging or? so, like, with that, you know what we do? We try to we try to make it so that they get done with their warm-up, at least their initial warm-up, because the initial warm-up is longer than their other warm-ups. I do the same warm-up every single time before matches. That, that'd, be, that'd be dumb. It's, it's the initial warm-up before the first match that's going to be the longest and then what we say normally is hey warm up and then 20 minutes before your match you should leave about 20 minutes uh, of time to get your mind right and to get ready you can still move around but like in terms of a lot of physical preparation um, it should be at a minimum because then you're just you're using energy that, it, that it's going to cost you in a match if you keep warming up extensively right up into the match. Now I know some people from a psychological psychological issue, they're like, some of our athletes are like, no, we need to do that. And I'll say, okay, you can do that. Mind, <laughs> mind can screw a lot of things up, so not gonna, I don't care what the research says, you feel like you need to do that, okay. And we'll, we'll try to we'll try to alter that maybe in the off season. Start practicing different techniques, not in season, in the off season. So we don't screw up your competition. So on a, on a match day where you're going to have five matches, what would that look like? Your initial warm-up period would be 15 minutes, and then before each match it would yeah, be... Yeah, or even longer. And honestly, it's like the context of your situation, the context of the athlete. Like we have athletes that we're in a training session, and it'll take them 15 to 20 minutes to properly warm up and get ready. 
It may take another athlete 30 minutes. Like, and that's at the, we have time. That's at your elite level. For you guys, um, just have a, a, your normal warm up progression. And then after that, maybe I'd do like half of that or bits and pieces of that uh, in terms of in between the other matches. Okay. I'll do the full thing. I went to the USA track and field one, and what they were saying is that the whole team should warm up for 15 minutes, yep. and then before each individual event, it was like a five minute time period that, you know, right before you step onto the blocks, or right before you do the next set of jumps or whatever, and, and I was wondering if you all had something like that that you could help us with, because, you know, I, let's say that we have 60 kids in the wrestling room and we're going to a tournament, and, you know, 15 varsity or 14 varsity is one thing, but, you know, let's say that you're going to a JV tournament and you got 60 kids, and they're all wrestling, I mean, is there a, a general rule of thumb that you could give us? Uh, I don't, it's, again, it's, I, I don't know exactly your situation and, and the athletes that you have, but maybe something that would be practical for you to do with that volume number of athletes would be to teach them the initial warm-up and then provide them with a sheet of paper or something like that that has a modified warm-up, your in-between match warm-up. Okay. And, say, and say to them, you don't, you don't have to do everything, we want you to do what you need to do to feel the most optimal for that match, but this is these are the guidelines, and this is the full shortened warm up that you could do okay. before your match. But you're not obligated to do the whole thing if you feel like it's not needed. Okay. You know. uh, resistance training basics. Uh, we have about say like ten minutes, eight minutes, so I'll try to kind of get through this. Um, uh, equation that I usually tell coaches. Um, so this is progressive overload plus recovery plus consistency plus effective effort equals positive training adaptations. Progressive overload just means systematically over time performing more work or doing uh, doing the same work in less time, whatever you want to, how you want to manipulate it, um, doing that in, over time. So we're, we're improving, we're adapting. Um, how to make sure that we're monitoring our progression, so in strength and conditioning, we're testing our athletes. We have athletes, they have their workout cards. They're recording their weights. Um, they're recording comments on how they feel that day or how they felt during the workout. Like We're monitoring a lot of things um, so we can look back and look at their progressions to see as a coach it what holds us accountable, see if what we're doing is actually uh, optimizing the training adaptations that we want. And also, it's nice for the athlete to see, hey, I'm progressing. Uh, kind of leads to some more intrinsic motivation. Um, recovery and rejuvenation. So mental and physical. We know that the physical aspect is just one component. The mental aspect is, is huge in terms of the stressors in life. I mean, they're going to school, they're uh, girlfriends, uh, maybe parents, the home life is a difficult situation. A lot of things going on. Maybe they're a, a year-long multi-sport athlete, um, which you get a lot of these kids. They're coming off the football season and uh, it may be a be better idea to say, hey, take a week off. I want you to come back more mentally and physically rejuvenated so it's not like we're just throwing you in the fire. Um, so that's, that's crucial. And then positive adaptations occur during the recovery period. Um, training, we're actually breaking down the body. During the recovery period, we're actually, we're actually doing, um, that's where the adaptations occur. Funny story, during our, our women's wrestling world team training camp before they left for Worlds this year, our coach, um, great coach, he's doing great things, he was crushing them in practice. So like Paul and I, we had a whole plan together for their strength and conditioning phases, but they came in and or, or we went and observed practice, <coughs> or they came in and we got feedback from the athletes. We altered totally what we did. It was supposed to be a lift, it turned into a foam rolling session. It was supposed to be conditioning, foam rolling. I think we lifted like three times during the span of three weeks with that team because they're doing their volume and intensity and in wrestling practice is so high. And, and I'll show you how we monitored their fatigue. There's another slide on that. So we got numbers from them. And uh, actually, it worked out well. They, they peaked and they, they ended up winning. We had two silver medalists, a gold medalist, and I think two uh, bronze medalists as well. So, they, they, did, they did fairly well at Worlds um, with that, but what I'm trying to say is you, got to you have to also think about what are they doing in wrestling practice. If you go from a high intensity wrestling practice to a strength training, same day, 
and that's 180 hours of high intensity work, you're going to have to give them, if you do that, you're going to have to give them two plus days of, of like low intensity recovery if you're going to do that. So, for a regular high school, <coughs> trying to fit lifting in in season. Yes. Uh, before school better, is, is that best yeah. for the kids just for a recovery standpoint? You know what, I would, I would agree with that and as opposed to going wrestling practice right into lifting and then they get out of lifting at 7 o'clock. They go home, have to eat, they're still all revved up, and then that decreases their sleep and they have to study. Yeah, I'd say lifting in the morning, that gives enough time to recover. How about on days of a competition? No, I would say, I'd say not lift. And, and in season, if we're, when we're talking in season, the volume of lifting is yeah. drastically going to decrease. That, you may be lifting one day a week and the volume that you do, uh -huh. it does not take a lot to maintain what you have or even uh, uh, decrease the rate of progression. So like what we do is maybe we will lift one or two days a week, maybe one depending on your competition schedule, and we'll have one heavy set. And we'll have a couple warm-up sets, four exercises, one heavy set, and we get a lot of our mo mobility and movement stuff in our warm-up. But anyway, what I'm trying to get at is warm-up, 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 heavy set, get out. They're not losing anything, and if I want to progress them, I might do a rep range. We're out, we're going, all right, we're going five to eight reps. First week we're doing five at that weight, next week six, next week eight. Then we're going to drop back to five and increase the weight then. Two, three times a week, what, I mean, what do you recommend as far as number of times a week? In season? Yeah. One to two. One to two. Yeah. Depending on your competition schedule. Yeah. We were doing Sunday evenings. Yeah. And I tried to we went church. Yeah, like, if they, yeah, if that works for your situation, and yeah, and they don't have a competition the next day, like, that could work, definitely. Um, so that's the recovery aspect, consistency, just making sure that they're sticking with the plan, like, we're in a day and age where there's a lot of plans coming out, and it's like, a different thing a week, different exercises a week. Um, you can't really monitor progression that way, it's very challenging. Um, so sticking with a plan, like I would say minimum six to eight weeks, especially at your level, and progressing um, in those movements, in those motions, it doesn't mean you have to stay at the same rep target. You can start off 12s, and then after a couple weeks, drop down to eights or tens. So that could be some variety there for the athlete. Um, but keeping consistency in what you're doing, that's going to allow you to see progress over time. And then effective effort. Um, anybody can do uh, uh, squat until they drop. Anybody can push up or pull a plank, whatever. Do a million pull-ups. Um, and they're giving great effort, but it, it may not be effective. Same thing with teaching skill acquisition to your to your athletes in terms of wrestling. You could be doing a skill technique session. An athlete may be doing uh, a move, but one of the steps is off. Well, if they keep doing that, and they could be giving all-out effort, like drenched with sweat, and great effort, you're doing awesome, but they're learning the wrong movement. They're doing the wrong movement, which is going to hinder their performance. It's like squatting like this, kind of a hitch to the side or knees in. We're just going halfway up on the pull-ups. It's great, you're feeling a great burn. Like you're getting strong right here, but it's not as effective as getting strong in the horning motion. So effective effort. Well, I guess one, I have two questions, yeah. kind of big back off the toes. In that one day lift, I guess, what is it that you think is the most important thing, important, like one heavy lift, do you kind of change it up, would it be a squat, a bench, a power clean, like what do you feel for that one day, and I guess that one heavy set, like what is it that we should be focusing on doing. Yeah, that's a good question. And, and I'll rephrase kind of what I said. I think I said one heavy set, but there will be multiple exercises. Not just one exercise, but uh, multi-joint movements that are like, if I had an upper back exercise, so um, a pull up or a row. Pull up one day, row on the other. If I had a knee dominant movement, squat one day or a goblet squat, trap bar deadlift one day, whatever you have, what's your knee dominant movement, that'd be the other one. A push, upper body push, whether it's a weighted push-up or a, a machine shoulder press, that could be one day or the other, that's your upper body push. An upper body pull or row 
I already went over that. Or a, uh, a, what, a hamstring or posterior chamber. So you got a knee dominant, a hip dominant, which is more hinging or like a leg curl sort of thing. Upper body push, upper body pull. Four, multi-joint exercises, big and basic. Get in, get out. So, and so I guess that, that kind of answers my other question. In kind of designing them, do you, like, how is it that you feel is the best way to target the full body or like, how is it that you're designing? Like, all right, we're going to do a shoulder press and then a squat and then, you know, like, what yeah, is what's, that? what's the template? There's a million different templates out there. Like, and there's not one way to skin a cat. There are many ways. I just make sure throughout the program that um, I do have a knee dominant, hip dominant, uh, upper body vertical pull, upper body horizontal pull, horizontal push, horizontal pull, uh, or horizontal push, vertical push. Um, making sure that I, and then it's really kind of knowing your athlete too. Um, that's a hard question to answer because each athlete's different. And I know that you guys don't have as much time on your end as we have here, like specificity that we can get. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I need to, oh my gosh, I do. Um, but it's, it's making sure that you have the different movements accounted for throughout your, your training. So periodization, um, pretty much organizing training so, so uh, you don't overtrain, so you're not plateauing, and so that you know that the specific goal of that training in a manner where I, I think of it as building a house, right? You have to build a foundation first in the off season. Um, get a base phase of training, increase their work capacity, their ability to do more work at a higher intensity. That's what you want out of them. And then as the season progresses into preseason, into in season, you're working at higher intensity. So look like this. That's what I just pretty much said. Off season, preseason, in season. Peaking is your championships. And active recovery is after your season's over. You tell your athletes to, to rest, but stay active. Uh, they can play basketball or something like that. Um, do what they need to do to recover. Um, you can see that as we progress, the volume of exercise, how much you're doing, the duration, the reps, that goes from high to low. The intensity goes from low to high. I have these in red. Why? Because I don't know the context of your situations. And your preseason, and depending on the outcome that you have, you may be sticking in the moderate or the low volume to, uh, or the moderate volume to moderate intensity range. Your athletes may not be ready to handle that, that high intensity that I'm going to be talking about. So you, it's under your discretion. You know your athletes better than I do. Same thing with in season. Like you may, there may be times in the in season where you have a bunch of competitions that don't mean that much to some of your top athletes. So you can go a little mod moderate volume and more of a moderate intensity, uh, but once you get into more competitions, you're decreasing the volume. Or where you're going, you start off with two days a week of lifting and then you drop it to one day a week of lifting as the season progresses. Just kind of tell me your discretion. When peaking is very, very low volume, you may not be lifting during that time. Or maybe it is the, you go from four exercises to two exercises. The intensity is very high. So training concentrations, this would be more in the off season, um, more of an aerobic phase, so building that foundation. Um, goals, establishing a base, enhanced mobility, this is where you're working on movement, cementing those movement patterns. Um, tempo just means the, how fast the reps are, so two up, two down, nice and smooth and controlled. Reps, this is where you're getting an 8 to 12 range, sets 3 to 4, rest between sets, 6 to 90 seconds. Um, so that's where that phase of training would, would kind of cater to. Conditioning, this is more of your long, slow, steady runs, uh, where you can get into more tempo methods, where if you're doing anything with heart rates, stuff like that, um, we have our athletes maybe get up to 160 beats per minute and then drop down to one, 145, back up to 160. 145 on a bike, that's like a tempo method. You're getting up to a tempo and decreasing. Hitting a range, decreasing. Higher intensity, lower. But you're not getting into like a all out anaerobic, very high intensity type of training. Your body's not ready for that. You're, you're building this capacity up to get to that higher phase of training. Others, this is just goes from 
low intensity to higher lactate threshold is the point at which your body starts to exponentially produce lactate and the clearance production rate is higher than the clearance rate. So training at lactate threshold, this training sucks. Um, excuse my, my language, but it's just not fun training. That's where you're training at that point. Um, right at that point, a little above, where you're producing a lot of lactate and you are holding it for two minutes and then resting for two minutes. Getting back up there, holding it for two minutes to ten minutes, right from there. Um, so those are examples. The next training concentration, this would be more the end of the off-season um, into uh, pre-season and then kind of holding on at a very low volume in-season. This is mainly where you're trying to increase your strength. You're trying to produce a lot of force, also increasing some power production. Tempo means three seconds on the way down. You're trying to, it should be a heavy enough weight where when you come up, it should be about two seconds. That's how heavy the weight is, but you're still trying to maximum get it up fast. Uh, reps three to six, so you saw, saw that the reps decrease, so the weight will increase. Sets three to four, rest increases now since the intensity is higher. So instead of uh, 60 to 90 seconds, now it's 90 to 120 plus. This is more of your lactate training in terms of conditioning, where you're going one to three work to rest ratios, one to, one to four, where you may be going 30 seconds all out sprinting or all out on the bike very, very hard, and then you have a 90 second to two minute active recovery. But those that 30 second sprints producing a lot of lactate, it's helping you to be able to tolerate that type of uh, training. Sorry, I'm speeding up here, guys. Like, I, I've got to get to that. Are you serious? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're giving us your slides, right? Yeah, what? You're giving us slides. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. Is that your telephone? Yeah. Yeah, 